Announcements about the future of the DC movie universe led by James Gunn and Peter Safran are right around the corner, which will potentially reignite the DC universe's reputation. They're making Superman a huge priority, and rightfully so, his image and reputation needs to recover a bit. However, there's another DC character, or rather side of the DC universe that may need it even more, and if Superman is the top priority, the Green Lantern Corps should be right behind him, and if not, of equal priority to Superman. The treatment of the Green Lanterns in live action over the years has been kind of sad. Alan Scott has only ever appeared in cameos in Smallville and Stargirl where he wasn't even played by an actor. Guy Gardner appeared in a terrible JLA pilot episode that never got picked up for series, and also he was nothing like his comic book counterpart, and none of the rest have ever appeared in live action, save of course for Hal Jordan, who obviously got the biggest ever live action appearance, getting his own movie in 2011 where he was played by Ryan Reynolds. Now keep in mind mind that around the time that this movie was greenlit, pun very intended, the Green Lantern Corps were consistently the most exciting part of the DC Universe, that being around the mid to late 2000s. During this run, written by Jeff Johns, the lore of the Green Lantern Corps became a universe in its own right, while the stories being told and the visuals being shown look like that if translated to the big screen, can potentially overtake Star Wars as the most epic space odyssey in cinematic history. At the time, the Green Lantern Corps had a lot of plans involved in terms of movies and TV shows, as they had two animated movies being released. An animated TV show was released in 2012, which, albeit it only lasted one season, that may also be because because of the live action movie that was released in 2011. That movie was a commercial and critical failure that basically pushed Green Lantern back 15 years to when they had far less cinematic potential in terms of like the lore of the Green Lantern Corps but also the technology that was afforded to them and despite being one of the core 5 DC heroes, Green Lantern because of this one movie no longer comes close to even the likes of Aquaman, let alone Flash, Wonder Woman, and obviously Superman and Batman in terms of popularity and even like merch being sold and comics being written. Basically, the Green Lantern franchise was tainted by a single movie, which in my opinion wasn't even that bad. Like, why did that movie push back Green Lantern more than Batman and Robin pushed back Batman? It doesn't really make sense, like it isn't that bad, but basically I think it's time people were shown what the Green Lanterns can do. My goal with this video is to show what I think the first Green Lantern movie should look like in what would end up becoming a five picture cinematic saga that is heavily inspired but not 100% derived, especially in the sequel, from the Jeff Johns mid to late 2000s run of Green Lantern, with everything culminating in The Blackest Night, which would also consider there being a Justice League movie between each one of these movies movies where at least one of the human lanterns appear, and maybe even like in the Infinity War or Endgame style Justice League movies they all appear, maybe one of them dies, so the Justice League movies will definitely have some sort of influence on the Green Lantern movies. That's less relevant for this video, however, as I'll be going over the first of these movies, which would also double as a pitch video for what I think a Green Lantern movie in James Gunn's universe should look like. Assuming the Justice League hasn't already been formed, I do think that's a direction they could go down, and I've mentioned that before, but let's just assume they aren't. Let's just assume that they're doing certain origin stories, and the Justice League has yet to form. So this is what I think the first movie should look like. Make sure to leave a like, share, and subscribe if you want me to make parts 2 to 5 of this series, but with that in mind, let's begin with a movie that would come out in late 2025, the second movie in the saga after the Superman movie, and I'd call it Green Lantern Emerald Dawn. Emerald Dawn is a story in the comics released between 1989 and 1990, which was a retelling of Hal Jordan's origin story, which will not be the basis for this movie, at least not entirely. It's just a much cooler and much more fitting title than the next retelling of his origin story, which is called Secret Origin, a far less compelling title, I think we can all agree. So yeah, Hal Jordan will be our first human Green Lantern, because while I did grow up on Jon Stewart and he was my favorite for a while, it's no denying that Hal Jordan is the most popular, but not only that, most of the best stories simply revolve around him, especially in this run, so I think they should start with Hal Jordan. 
I won't get much into casting for other characters, but I do think that the popular choice Glenn Powell, most famous for his role in Top Gun Maverick where he plays another pilot, would absolutely be perfect for this role. He is a bit older than you would expect, he's 34, which is undoubtedly older than the Superman of this universe, what he's going to be, but there's nothing that says that Hal has to be the same age as the other Justice League members, you could balance it out by saying that he's less mature, so they all feel like they're the same age. What this would mean, however, is that Hal would be in his late 40s by the end of this saga, and not only do I not have a problem with that, I think it's really cool to see characters like these age with time. They could even give him his post-crisis look with the white streaks in his hair, which would be really fitting. But anyway, why retell the origin story? Well, while I personally wouldn't mind skipping it, I don't think Green Lantern is like Superman or Batman or Spider-Man where the general audiences are entirely familiar with his origin, so you could just skip it. The 2011 movie exists and is also inspired by the same comic book, but like I said, that movie flopped, which means general audiences didn't even really watch it, so let's give it another go. But this time around, we're going to be a bit more faithful to that specific comic. The comic being Green Lantern's secret origin, which refocused Hal's origin to be the beginning of the Blackest Night saga, with foreshadowing retconned in from the very beginning. Blackest Night was the big event they were building up to at the time, and this saga will build up to the same thing, so I think keeping the Blackest Night foreshadowing works really well, even if it would take four movies to get there. So there's a prophecy in the Book of Oa called the Blackest Night. The Guardians of the Universe fear this prophecy, and thus it's forbidden for the members of the Corps to read it. It is, however, known to the Five Inversions, who are a space terrorist group imprisoned by the Guardians of the Universe, who are made up of the sole survivors of Sector 666. After the Guardians' first attempt at a peacekeeping agency, the Manhunters went rogue and completely massacred the entire space sector. These survivors were vengeance against the Guardians, which is a little bit understandable to be honest, and one of those beings is Atrocitus, the future leader of the Red Lantern Corps. The prophecy tells about the War of Light, the fall of the Green Lantern Corps, and the end of life in the universe, which is all told by the Five Inversions to Abin Sur, the Green Lantern of Sector 2814, who would become more and more obsessed with this prophecy, especially when he's told that the whole thing will begin in his sector, and more specifically on Earth and that he's told of his own death, and that his successor will be the greatest Green Lantern to ever live. Abin would become so obsessed that he'd frequently revisit the Five Inversions to ask how he can prevent it, and eventually he'd become so obsessed that Atrocitus would manage to convince Abin Sewer to free him and bring him to Earth. Abin would bring Atrocitus to Earth, but wouldn't trust him enough to not keep him in a cell on his ship. Atrocitus would escape from his cell, however, and would mortally wound Abin Sur, which he was able to do in combination of Abin's powers being weakened due to his fear of the prophecy, in combination with Atrocitus secretly having a powerful weapon on hand called the Cosmic Divining Rod. This movie would set a precedence for the Green Lanterns being weaker when they are afraid, while the yellow impurity aspect of it all would be focused on in the immediate sequel. Anyway, Atrocitus jumps out of Abensur's ship while it comes falling down to Earth and goes off to search for this avatar of death that is in the prophecies, a man named William Hand. While this whole story is being told throughout Act 1, we'd also see Hal Jordan in a much more grounded parallel story, and obviously the two stories collide when Abensur's ship crash lands on Earth. The two Act 1 stories up until they collide would span multiple decades and would basically parallel each other in terms of time being passed. The Hal Jordan side of things would start very similarly to the 2011 movie, where we would see Hal as a kid witnessing his father crashing and dying in a test flight, which wouldn't slow down his passion for wanting to be a pilot himself at all, even if his mother completely forbids it because of the trauma she now associates with it. On his 18th birthday, Hal would join the Air Force in spite of his mother's wishes, and in response to this, his mother, who has cancer by the way, refuses to see him unless he quits his career path. When his mother's cancer gets worse a couple years later, and she's on the brink of death, Hal gets himself dishonorably discharged from the Air Force in order to go visit her, but arrives to the hospital mere minutes after her death. Hal was much closer to his father in his life, but his older brother Jack was very close to his mother, and not too long after this, Jack would commit suicide, leaving Hal and his younger brother Jim in a very dark place. 
I do understand why they didn't include any of Hal Jordan's family in the 2011 movie. The movie was bloated with things for the audience to digest, and while it didn't turn out well, I get why they didn't include them. There just wasn't any room for it. However, this time around, not only do I think there is room, but I think it is very necessary to ground Hal Jordan and for the emotional core of the movie, which will be his younger brother Jim, which I think is very necessary for the audience to get invested in Hal Jordan. But now that he's out of a job, Hal would become a test pilot for Ferris Air, and then he would spend the next decade or so of his career, and also, he meets his on-again, off-again girlfriend and boss, Carol Ferris. This is obviously when the two Act 1 stories collide, Abin Sir crashes on Earth, and during a test flight, Hal is whisked away by a green light to that crash site. Abin then passes his ring onto Hal and tells him to never feel free fear even in the face of sure death. Hal would have this moment where he would respond by looking at his plane, smiling and saying something along the lines of I never do, before Abin would then warn him about Atrocitus and die in his arms. Right after this, we would see a scene on Oa, which would be the only scene on Oa in this entire movie, where the Guardians would be informed about Abinsur's death at the hands of Atrocitus, and they send Sinestro to help Abin's rookie replacement with apprehending him. So yeah, while we will see a good amount of space in the first act with Abin Sur, and then in this one scene on Oa, Hal Jordan himself wouldn't actually leave Earth for basically the entire movie until the very end where there's a tease for the future of this franchise. I like this idea because by starting small er compared to what we will get to, we get people invested in Hal Jordan while more easily digesting the sheer magnitude of lore involved in the story. Because with everything we already have and then adding the additional Green Lantern Corps members and how the Corps operates and most specifically what the alien world of Oa looks like and how it operates, there would be too much in this movie. The sequel will focus on that, and we could potentially even see things through new eyes, even if Hal Jordan has already been there for a while, through Jon Stewart, which will be what the next movie will be about. But this movie will be much more grounded and Earth-based, relatively that is, since already in Act 1, it isn't entirely Earth-based, but compared to the rest of the saga, this is very, very grounded. So this brings us to Act 2, which will focus on how Jordan trying to learn how to use his powers, but also try to explain to Carol where he disappeared to and what happened to his plane. I would throw any possibility of a secret identity situation out of the window. In a scene where Hal tries to explain to Carol what happened and attempts to keep his powers a secret, but then Sinestro shows up and straight up attacks him, and right in front of all the other Ferris employees, and Carol herself, he would turn into the Green Lantern to defend them, because I think the MCU has kind of made it so that superheroes don't need secret identities. Some of them, like Batman and Superman, definitely do, but like Iron Man and Captain America and DC heroes like Aquaman and Wonder Woman, not only do they not need civilian identities, and if they have civilian identities, it's not something you could keep separate from the hero identity, like Aquaman, he's the king of Atlantis, you can't keep those things separate. And all those things combined, I do think it fits Green Lantern, he falls into that category because the role and responsibility that's thrust upon you when you become a Green Lantern, I don't think allows for a civilian identity, especially in the space epic I think they should cover in these movies. He's going to be Green Lantern a lot more than he's Hal Jordan in the long run. He's basically been drafted to a cosmic military, and his new life I don't think allows for a civilian identity, or honestly any significant time on Earth, so I'm completely disregarding the concept of secret identities in these movies for all of the human characters. So like I said, Sinestro shows up and attacks Hal, he does this in order to test him, or to train him, and then throughout Act 2, Sinestro would train Hal while they attempt to track down Atrocitus, and he would teach him about the Oath and the Green Lantern Corps and what powers his ring, which audiences who aren't familiar with uh, the whole lore of the Green Lantern Corps would also learn through Sinestro in this movie. The duo obviously got off to a rocky start, but I would really like to emphasize how by the end of this movie, and then in the beginning of the next one, they don't only learn to respect each other and they don't only become reluctant allies who respect each other, they become genuinely good friends, as I think when Sinestro inevitably goes evil and becomes yellow, that betrayal would hit much harder if Hal Jordan sees him as a genuine friend, and also Sinestro sees Hal as a genuine friend. 
While this is happening, in a parallel story in Act 2, we would get to know William Hand, who is a really creepy individual. From a young age, he was always obsessed with death, he'd kill animals and turn them into taxidermy as a kid, and even did so to his own family's dog, an event that is lifted directly from the comics, which also led to him being sent to a psychiatrist, who taught him to ignore these impulses, and then William actually managed to not become a serial killer, and instead focuses his death into his work as a coroner working at a morgue. Now, I don't necessarily think you could have all of this backstory in the movie itself. Like, it might feel a bit disjointed for the pacing of this movie to have another series of flashbacks showing a person as a kid and growing into an adult, so instead, we do get a good amount of William Hand in the second act, and we see him in the morgue, and like the people around him say that he's super weird and they really don't trust him, and then we see him doing some weird things with the bodies and the corpses, but then we don't learn about his past from his side of things, we learn about it from Atrocitus, who has a scene or two where he has like a vision of William Hand, like he had in the comics, that show him why he is the doorway to darkness that he thinks he is. Obviously, this whole not becoming a serial killer thing would not last forever because he's approached by Atrocitus, who tells him about his future. Atrocitus believes that inside of William is the key to the doorway to darkness, and he wants nothing more than to take that key for himself so that he can unleash the darkness on the guardians of the universe. Now, in the comics, Atrocitus actually attacks William, and then Hal and Sinestro stop him, which allows William to steal the cosmic divining rod from Atrocitus, which he uses to become Black Hand. In Instead, I'd have them at least initially work together, so basically Atrocitus shows William the prophecy and actually gives him the Cosmic Divining Rod, a weapon that Atrocitus mentions he spent years searching for as it was itself a part of the prophecy. In the comics, it's capable of draining a Green Lantern's power, but I'd simplify it a bit because I do not want the Green Lantern's powers to be drained in this movie. Instead, it's a very powerful killing device that grows stronger the more people you kill. Right after Atrocitus gives him the Cosmic Divining Rod, Hal and Sinestro show up after a scene or two where they start tracking Atrocitus down, and they attack him. Atrocitus is easily outmatched by the two Green Lanterns as he doesn't have his Cosmic Divining Rod, but William Hand does not take long to decide what to do. He's basically been validated, all of his crazy and evil thoughts about death have been validated by this prophecy and this alien god coming down from space telling him that he is the Chosen One, and he basically goes with it, he attacks the Green Lanterns and takes Hal one on one. With Hal distracted, Atrocitus shows Sinestro a vision of the future and his role to play in it, as Sinestro will have a very large role. Sinestro sees himself leading an army of Yellow Lanterns against Hal, who's leading an army of Green. With Sinestro distracted by this vision, Atrocitus helps William to beat Hal to a bloody pulp before the two of them leave, thinking that Hal is dead and Sinestro is completely distracted. This is the end of Act 2, and with our heroes at their lowest point, Hal is literally beaten to the brink of death, and Sinestro now doubting his future and doubting his morals as a part of the Green Lantern Corps. This brings us to Act 3. In this third and final act, Sinestro would deal with the vision he saw, by the end of the act he would choke it up to being a power that Atrocitus has that he used tactically, but this vision would definitely come back to haunt Sinestro in a sequel, a third movie, a fourth movie, they would all come true, whatever you saw it will come true, and he will definitely mention the vision again, but for this movie specifically he does not think that that is his actual future. And then Hal deals with feeling like he got more than he bargained for after being almost beaten to death, so Hal and Sinestro separate for a bit while Sinestro tries to track Atrocitus down again, and Hal goes to his brother's house, which we'll get back to in a minute, it is definitely important. Atrocitus would begin to try and train William to do his bidding, and while William does initially agree to work for Atrocitus, he asks to be taken to his childhood home first, which Atrocitus agrees to, which is a huge mistake on Atrocitus' part. William would find his family, the same family who, rightfully so, ostracized him and cast him aside, but William would lose it and go crazy and kill all of them, save for his younger brother, as his younger brother was the only one who was ever nice to him when he was a kid. William would then start to lose it. He would attack Atrocitus, which would knock him out completely, as he just killed a couple people and now the Cosmic Divining Rod is even more powerful. William would now realize that the weapon gets stronger the more people he's killed. So basically, he just goes with it again. He likes killing, he's obsessed with death, he has a weapon that kills more people the more people he kills. 
So that's basically what he goes to do. Before doing so, however, he wants to make himself a supervillain costume. He has this natural inclination to do so, and he goes to his morgue, and he takes a body bag and cuts it up. We basically have a scene where he does all that, he starts to cut it up, we cut our way, we cut back, and he has his costume, which is basically exactly how it went down in the comics. The costume also has an insignia, which, unbeknownst to him, is actually the insignia of the future Black Lantern Corps, which we'll get to in a potential future video. And I mentioned that he wouldn't kill his younger brother and only his younger brother because right after that there would be a parallel scene showing the parallels between Hal Jordan and William Hand, as the next scene would be Hal Jordan going to his younger brother's house, which would be the emotional climax of this story. Which, first of all, should be an emotional reunion between two brothers who have lost everyone else in their family and haven't seen each other in a while. Jim has a wife and two daughters now who barely know Hal as he's remained distant for the last few years. This is the scene where I want to make it impossible for audiences to not get emotionally invested in Hal Jordan. He's bloody, he's beaten, he's finally feeling fear for the first time in his life, and he's gone to the one family he has left after, again, losing all of the rest. And then Hal would explain the entire story to Jim, because not only do I, again, not care for Hal having a secret identity, but also because this would be a great moment, because Jim would be completely blown away. He is amazed by the world that Hal Jordan has now entered. Jim would compare Hal to Superman and Batman, the two most famous superheroes that are already established in this universe. If the JSA existed in the past instead of an alternate universe and they're known by the public, then he should definitely compare Hal Jordan to members of the JSA with a not so subtle nod to Alan Scott. Jim would be absolutely amazed by this new world his brother has entered. This amazement from his little brother would bring back a little bit of fighting spirit in Hal, but not enough, as Hal counters by saying that he's not a hero, he betrays trade mom, he thinks that his older brother's death is partially his fault, which his little brother would cut him off and double down on the comparison to Superman. He'd tell Hal that he has made mistakes in his life, and some of those mistakes hurt his loved ones, like now, as he's taking his distance from Jim and his family, he's not perfect, but if there's one thing he always admired in his older brother, it's his determination and fearlessness and his willpower. He would tell him that the world needed Superman when he arrived, and that the world may now need Hal Jordan. Jim mentioning the word will invokes a visible reaction from Hal, as Sinestro earlier told him that the ring is powered by his will, but also, he's inspired by Jim, he's inspired by the comparison to Superman and the, all the other heroes, and how Jordan realizes what his life has now become. He's a superhero. Jim's wife would then turn on the news to reveal that Coast City is being terrorized by a man calling himself Black Hand. Hand, like I said, has been completely enamored by his newfound power and its enormous possibility for death. I do know that Hand, basically just using his weapon to cause destruction in Coast City on Earth, is not very creative. It feels so simple in comparison to the big prophecies that have been teased, and also for himself. But that is kind of the point. It'd be made very clear that everything teased in this movie would happen at some point in the next four movies, but not only is this movie much more grounded and frankly lower stakes to set the basis for this story, but also that is kind of the point of Black Hand. He's not a super smart, calculating villain, he's just a regular person, albeit a crazy person who's obsessed with death, but a mortal nonetheless, who is obsessed with death and gains the power to bring about an enormous amount of death. So he just goes for it, especially since, like I mentioned earlier, the more people he kills, the more people his device kills. Later in the saga, he'd come back as Necron's avatar of the Black Lantern Corps, but for right now, he just wants to kill as many people as he can, kind of like the Joker in that sense. Hal sees this on TV and does not hesitate. He calls upon his lantern and recites the oath in the brightest day and blackest night taught to him by Sinestro, and this would be a triumphant moment with triumphant music because honestly, the oath scenes are always my favorite. They're so cool. Hal calls Sinestro, but he has located Atrocitus and just begins to fight him, so it's up to Hal to stop the Black Hand. 
The big climactic final fight of the movie would involve Sinestro defeating Atrocitus, but much more importantly, how Jordan defeats the Black Hand. There's not much to describe here in terms of the story, it's just a lot of fighting, and also a little bit of saving lives. How Jordan's powers allows him to fight the villain, but also save lives at the same time. I want to see him not only fight the villain, but also be a hero and save people's lives, and also minimize the destruction. But it is definitely very important to emphasize that the visuals need to look good. For Green Lantern's powers to look cool, for Hal's cool suit to look cool, everything needs to look good, because otherwise the movie will fail. It's more important for Green Lantern than most other heroes, and I think the visuals were a big part of why the 2011 movie failed, so they should definitely put a lot of work and emphasis into perfecting the Green Lantern visuals on screen. The movie would then end with Black Hand losing his weapon and being arrested, Hal spends a bit of time with his brother and nieces before telling them goodbye as he's about to leave Earth, Hal says goodbye to Carol Ferris as well and officially quits his job before flying off to space with Sinestro who's taking Atrocitus as well as the Cosmic Divining Rod at Toa. Now you might have noticed that Carol Ferris wasn't really in the movie much and that is true. This movie would have been packed with a lot of different ideas and storylines that do all come together but I didn't think there was much room for her all that much. I had to choose one emotional core for Hal Jordan's story and I thought that his little brother would be far more effective in that regard. Plus, we've already seen love interest Carol Ferris before in the 2011 movie, and while that did lead to the marriage between Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively, this saga will be taking Carol in a completely different direction, which if you know her comic history, you already might be able to guess what that is. So that is my pitch for what a Green Lantern movie in James Gunn's universe would look like. Again, this is assuming that the Justice League hadn't already formed, taking heavy inspiration from Secret Origins, with the ground being laid for what can very well be, like I said a bunch of times already, the greatest space odyssey in cinematic history. I genuinely believe it has more potential than Star Wars. Unless this video completely tanks, I will definitely make a part 2 to this, and hopefully there will be enough demand for all 5 parts, because I think it's really interesting, it's really something I would love to see, but we'll see if it works. Thanks for watching, goodbye!